Good evening and welcome on behalf of the New York Society Library. I'm Sarah Elliott Holliday, Head of Events, and I'm just here very briefly to welcome you to this webinar and to say a brief word about tonight's speakers. Dr. James O. Powelski is Professor of Practice and Director of Education in the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also the author, co-author, or co-editor of five books, including the Oxford Handbook of the Positive Humanities and the editor of the Humanities and Human Flourishing book series with Oxford University Press. Dr. Angus Fletcher is a professor of story science at Ohio State's Project Narrative. He has dual degrees in neuroscience and literature, received his PhD from Yale, taught Shakespeare at Stanford, and has published two books and dozens of peer-reviewed academic articles on the scientific workings of novels, poetry, film, and theater. His book, Wonder Works, has been called Fascinating by Malcolm Gladwell and Refreshing and Remarkable by Jay Perini, while beloved bestseller Brene Brown said, I'm totally obsessed with Wonder Works. It swallowed me whole. We encourage you to buy your copy of Wonder Works from our independent friends at the Corner Bookstore. That link is in the chat at the right. Please also add your own questions and comments to the chat throughout the evening, and the speakers will address them later in the program. Now, please enjoy this conversation with Angus Fletcher and James O. Powelski. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate that uh, warm introduction. We're really grateful to the New York Society Library for organizing this event and for inviting us. And we uh, really welcome each of you who are here with us uh, tonight. Angus, it's great to see you. Can't wait for this conversation. It's fantastic to see you, James. So Angus, maybe we should um, admit uh, to the audience that we actually know each other and that we've known each other for a while. And maybe we ought to give just a brief kind of origin story of, of our connection, because I think it, um, uh, it will maybe illuminate in some ways the topic that we want to, to discuss. So I met you, Angus, uh, what was it, like 2014, something like that-ish? Yeah. You were much younger. Yeah. Yeah. Much, much younger, much younger. Um, I had just come back from a, a conference in China. I was, I was jet lagged. I was not drunk. I was jet lagged uh, when we met. I, I heard about this fascinating conference on the arts and uh, neuroscience, and I had to go. Uh, and I went to this conference, and lo and behold, the keynote speaker was one Angus Fletcher. And I was so incredibly impressed with the um, presentation that you had there, the ways in which you brought your background with a PhD in literature and your work in neuroscience uh, in such illuminating and inspiring ways. I happen to have just uh, co-edited a volume bringing together positive psychology and literature. And I happened to bring a copy of that with me, the eudaimonic turn, well-being and literary studies. And I presented you with a copy of that book. And I found out later that you found that to be really impressive. Yeah, well, as sometimes happens, that book changed my life. And uh, hopefully there are people here in the audience that have had a similar experience where someone has given them a book, they've taken a book off a library shelf, maybe they've just been browsing, uh, they open the pages, they get hooked, and then wheels start to turn in the head and a transformation happens. And that's definitely what happened to me because, um, as the audience doesn't know, you are an expert in positive psychology, which was a field that I myself had not really experienced at that time. And my own background and my own interest in literature was very much about how literature could be used in therapy and also how literature can be used in creativity. And I've worked with veterans groups and other communities and lots of small kids. Um, and then I read your book and your book said, hey, Angus, don't you think that maybe books sometimes spark joy in the brain? And don't you think books aren't just about solving problems, they're also about opening possibilities and inspiring optimism and all these kinds of positive things. And uh, it took me out, because I mean, as a scholar, pretty much all you do is you go around all day with problems and concerns. And how do I fix problems? And the world's got so many problems, I gotta fix these problems. And it made me realize that life isn't just about problems, it's about possibilities. And that's a huge reason why we go to literature in the first place. And so, as you know, that ended up us doing some research together and, and research with other labs as well that has kind of unlocked some of that positive potential in literature. 
Well, thanks, Angus. It was it was kind of you to um, uh, be gracious when this stranger came up with uh, you know with a book in tow uh, and actually to take a look at it. Um, I'm and I'm delighted that uh, that 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 has allowed us um, to connect in these various ways. And your work, uh, your book, Wonderworks, uh, is just a phenomenal um, um, uh, elucidation and elaboration on some of those themes and comes at it in a way that in my view is both um, just inspiring and helpful and also um, just incredibly insightful. And I find myself as I read this book on so many pages going, oh, I didn't know about that. Oh, I didn't know, you know, and so you, you are so knowledgeable in so many different areas, truly a polymath, and you bring that together in ways that are um, both just, you know, uh, music to the mind of a nerd like me, and also really helpful from the standpoint of somebody who is interested in how, in, in what we can do to help, uh, in, in, you know, make our lives better and make the world better. So I wonder if we could start in with some of the themes uh, in Wonder Work, um, Wonder Works, and in particular, you know, of course, the place we have to start is Saint Jerome, right? And so you talk about Saint Jerome, you know, working uh, away, uh, burning the midnight oil, translating the Bible into the Vulgate, um, and you know, and 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 he's going to get it right because this is sacred scripture. And so he is going to make a translation that, you know, is perfect. And what he finds is that he can't do it because darn it, language, <laughs> it's slippery, it's messy. And he finds that he has to interpret what he's working on. And so what, what, he, what starts out as a translation winds up to be an interpretation. And you argue that that is kind of a seminal point in literature which has not only sacred literature, but also other forms of literature have thought about the work of interpretation as being the key job when you're studying literature. And you're not satisfied with that. Why? Well, that's right. Well, I mean, so interpretation is the thing that most of us are trained to do in school with literature. We're trained to read the words and try and discover what they mean. And then we write papers about them and then we debate those meanings with other people and scholars publish books about it and the interpretation and the debate goes on. Um, just as in modern literary studies as in medieval biblical studies. But you know, for me, as viable as interpretation is and all these things are, that's not our primary experience of reading. That's something we have to be trained and taught to do. And our primary experience of reading is just as a child, you pick up a book and it fires your imagination. You suddenly have ideas in your head and you have places in your head and you have people in your head that you never had before. And you go on adventures and those adventures continue after you've stopped reading. It's not just the book giving you those adventures. It increases your ability to imagine more adventures. So imagination, creativity, these are very kind of basic things that happen anytime you pick up a book as a child. And then, of course, also the emotional experience of literature. Uh, it gives you the experience of, of joy. I mean, that's why so many of us go to books. It also gives us the experience of companionship, of having a friend, you know, we bond with literature. It also helps us process grief and loneliness. There are all these moments we go for solace or healing to literature. And those are phenomena that can't be explained by interpretation. Those are things that are happening on a more immersive psychological level. And so, you know, I, I just wanted to understand those things. I wanted to understand how does literature do this amazing thing? Um, I wanted to kind of go back to my, almost my childhood self um, before I'd learned about interpretation, before I'd created that scholarly distance with the text and instead just jump in with my mind and that kind of direct engagement. And I wanted to kind of understand how it was the literature, you know, the actual nuts and bolts of how literature did all those things. And that's why I kind of shift the focus from interpretation to what I call inventions or moments where writers discover ways to use story in order to trigger different and distinct psychological responses in the human brain. So you're not interested just in what a text means. You're interested in what a text does, right? And what it does for us, to us, how it changes our lives. And this is something I think you're quite right that the emphasis has gone the other way 
oftentimes in the study of literature. In fact, if you're too caught up with the ways in which you're responding to the literature, that's the first thing that freshmen need to be disabused of. It's not about you, it's about the literature. It's about the levels of interpretation. It's about you know the ideologies that you can discover and um, you know be archaeologically approaching the text and so forth, which can yield some really interesting insights and so forth, and is in danger of bypassing and even um, ignoring or um, uh, devaluing that process, as you described, of reading literature and what it does for us and to us and how we engage with it. And so we sometimes think of reading as a kind of guilty pleasure, or if we take pleasure in reading, like I know we're not, if you're a serious scholar, you're really not supposed to, right? Which is ridiculous because um, as Rita Felsky points out, you know, you can pretend that you're not responding in some kind of human way when you're reading the text as a scholar, but you are because you're a human being. And what I think you're saying is, you know what, let's not worry, let's, 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 let's be human beings and let's actually, center on that and try to understand what that process um, is like. So I want to contrast kind of Jerome, you know, working on his Vulgate with, you, you talk a lot about Aristotle. Um, and, and, and Aristotle is kind of an interesting figure because you talk about, you know, the philosophers of ancient Greece who, through whom we know most about the sophists who were kind of their rivals, kind of the bad guys uh, in the in the minds of Plato, right? Uh, these were people who, you know, played fast and loose with the truth and were just all about, you know, winning court cases and so forth. And so um, you talk about the sophists, the rhetoricians and the philosophers, um, and you talk about philosophers oftentimes being dismissive of the sophists and to some degree of the rhetoricians as well. But then you interestingly talk about Aristotle and the poetics and ways in which Aristotle comes into this, um, you know, emphasizes the invention piece of literature. So tell us a little bit more about Aristotle and the poetics. Yeah, so, I mean, this is the extraordinary thing about the book is, is how really deeply unoriginal it is, is that pretty much the entire method of the book is 2,400 years old. Um, and, you know, the shocking thing is, is as old as that method is, um, if people want to go on the internet and read the response that the literary critics have had about this book, um, you would have think that I had invented some radical new iconoclasm, you know, and that I was destroying modern literary studies because it's so different from the way that we read now. It is, however, ancient. It's very ancient. Um, and it's brilliant in my view. What Aristotle basically does um, and so Aristotle, you know, he's, a, he's, a, he's just a wonderful thinker. And one of the things that makes him such a wonderful thinker is he's just so curious. And he studies under Plato, and Plato has all these answers for everything. And, and Aristotle goes, I like all these answers, Plato, but, you know, I feel like there's more to life. I just feel like there's more. And he goes up on all these fascinating expeditions. You know, he's studying fish, and he's wandering off to the Isle of Lesbos, picking flowers. And he's just constantly curious and exploring. And, you know, one of the things he, he notices is that Greek tragedies have these extraordinary effects on people. And, you know, Plato had just dismissed Greek tragedy as a bunch of lies. <laughs> Plato says, it's a pack of lies. None of it really ever happened. You know, if there's any use for it at all, it's a kind of propaganda. You can brainwash people with it or something like that. But Aristotle says, no, I see two really interesting psychological effects. Um, the first is that I see people experiencing catharsis. I see people, veterans, who are going to these plays in a state of grief and even post-traumatic, what we'd call today, post-traumatic stress disorder. I see this happening and I see it starting to help heal them. How is that happening? How are they watching these plays and how is it starting to heal them? And then the other thing that Aristotle sees is that the audiences experience what he would call a spiritual experience. That they go and they feel themselves connected with something bigger than themselves. And in a very literal sense, of course, there's gods walking around the stage, you know, and, and so you could say, well, you know, there's a kind of religious theological aspect, but it's more than that because these gods can be humorous, they can be ridiculous, they can be all these things. But even in plays where there aren't gods, audiences have this sense of awe, of wonder. And so what you see with these plays is that they not only take people who are feeling low and bring them back to feeling normal, but they take people who are feeling normal and then lift them up. And Aristotle says, there's got to be something going on in these plays that's doing that. And what he says is, it's not the language. The language is interesting, the language is valuable, and the language can do all sorts of interesting things. 
but it's the story, it's the plot. This is Aristotle's intuition. And he pulls out these plot mechanisms and he shows how these plot mechanisms can have these effects. And the simplest example is just the plot twist. Anytime you're watching a story and there's a plot twist, um, a plot twist is something that in retrospect is obvious because it's an unbroken link in a chain of events that sort of had to happen, that's inevitable. But at the moment it happens, it's totally surprising because it, it, it suggests something in the universe that you didn't see happening. You didn't see what the logical consequence of all these events were. And so it blows your mind because it makes you say, all these things that I see around me, all these logical things, they can mean more. They can mean something that I never expected. All of these things I have around me could be leading in a direction that I never saw. And we know that Aristotle was right about both the healing effect and about the spiritual effect. And, you know, to take the case of the spiritual effect, we can see that when you give people plot twists, uh, it leads to deactivation in certain parts of the brain that are associated with the self and self-consciousness. And it opens people up and makes them more compassionate. And it leads to that effect that we often call getting lost in a book where you lose yourself um, or you feel yourself merging with something bigger. So, all of this really just comes from Aristotle. And I was just very lucky because I came along and I realized that in 2,400 years, no one had really ever attempted to extend Aristotle. All they'd done is argue about whether he was right or wrong. And no one had ever said, well, maybe there's other plot devices that could do more things. And so what I basically do in the book is I say, there's a lot more plot devices, do a lot more things, there's a lot more of these inventions. And some of them have this effect of kind of lifting you from low back up to where you were before. So helping you with grief, helping you with trauma, helping you with loneliness, helping you with pessimism. And then some of them, you know, sort of in your wheelhouse, James, have this even more extraordinary effect of lifting us up and giving us joy and curiosity and hope and creativity and sparking all these positive effects in the mind. And so really all the book does is it says, literature can do these things and I'm going to tell you the specific plot devices that were invented over time and not just plot devices, character devices, other kinds of story devices. And then I'm going to give them to you in a book so that you can find them in all your own favorite books and you can understand why your books have this amazing magical effect on your brain. So if you'll allow me a metaphor, Angus, uh, it seems to me that um, if we were talking not about literature, but about food, we would have you know, scholars who would say, oh my goodness, like we're gonna, we're gonna do a chemical analysis of this food and we're gonna understand, you know, its properties and all of that. And there are all these, you know, um, associations and journals that, are, that arise to do this. And then you've got other people who are like, no, 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 no. That's not the most important, uh, you know, way to think about food. You need to think about the, 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 um, the, ethno origins of the food, like the cultural origins, like where, why did food develop in these certain ways? And so other people are like, no, 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 no. You gotta think about the, few, the food distribution systems, like where is it grown? How is it shipped? And on and on and on and on. And I think what you're saying is Aristotle pointed out, there's another purpose of food. And that is like, it, it's really cool when you eat it, That's right. right? And different food has different effect. And what you're saying is, whoa, that's true. So what if we methodically looked at what happens when you eat proteins? What happens when you eat vegetables? What happens when you eat, you know, different things in different amounts? Of, and it has a really powerful effect on our minds, on our bodies, and so forth. And so I see Wonderworks, forgive again the analogy, but I feel like Wonderworks is like this categorization or the beginning of a categorization of the actual practical effects that can come from eating. That's beautiful. No, and I love that because I'm a materialist in the book, you know, and I say there's not, you, we don't want to be embarrassed by materialism. We don't want to be embarrassed by the body. We don't want to be embarrassed by practical things. I mean, of course, there can be more than materialism. There can be more than the body, but that doesn't mean that the body and, and materialism aren't worth something. And yeah, I think absolutely. I'd love to read a book that connects me with taste, you know, tells me this food just makes you so happy for these reasons, or it sparks these parts of your brain and does these things for you. And that kind of visceral experience is, of course, why we as living creatures eat and delight in food and also why we delete, delight in arts and delight in theater and delight in film and poetry and all these things because they do have this deep effect, which is connected to emotion and all these kinds of bodily parts of ourselves. And I do think that in school, there is kind of this embarrassment almost 
about talking about food or talking about art and literature in these ways. Like, you know, if you went and took a food science class and everyone was talking about how delicious chocolate was, they'd be like, no, 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 no. We're not here to talk about how delicious chocolate is. It means to your point, what's the chemical right. substance of chocolate and, you know, where do we get it from and what's the history of chocolate? Um, but I just want to have a class where we talk about how good chocolate tastes and how it can give us joy. Um, and, you know, how sometimes when you're feeling down, if you just eat a little bit of chocolate, it makes you feel better. And, you know, that's part of the point of the book. And of course, also beyond that, as we know, so many of these stories were written to help people in times of their most urgent crisis. You know, we talked about the example of Greek tragedy and the veterans. I mean, so much of the literature in the book is about people suffering from trauma, suffering from grief, suffering from loneliness, um, suffering from sort of catastrophic pessimism and despair, um, a sense of the loss of God or purpose or meaning or anything in life. And literature can help the brain move out of those states. Um, I would never recommend it in the case of clinical depression or something like that. That's not the point of the book is to say it's a substitute for psychiatry or psychology. But it is to say that in the same way that eating a healthy diet every day can just kind of improve your overall well-being, you know, thinking, curating the books that you read just a little bit and making a little bit of an effort to kind of stretch your palate and read some different types of literature and kind of do that slightly hard work of maybe reading outside your comfort zone, that can also kind of grow and strengthen your mental health and well-being in kind of long and durable ways. Okay, so enough words, let's get into the chocolate. Uh, so your book uh, frames this brilliant, fascinating methodology, which is again, very different from what we find in typical literary studies approaches, very different from what we find in general in the university, which tends to be about the study of things as opposed to the use of things and the application of things, right? The actual eating of the chocolate. So let's just take uh, one of, so you have 25 different um, flavors of chocolate or 25 different uh, foods. I don't know what how, how to quite, to fit that into the analogy. But I wonder if we could just start, you mentioned pessimism, right? So let's, let's start with pessimism and optimism. Um, and could you tell us a little bit about what literary technologies can help us to um, overcome our pessimism and to invite optimism? And what does this have to do with Puss in Boots? So, yeah. So, again, I'm going to be totally honest that this research specifically was inspired by you and, um, you know, your lab and, and your research into, into optimism. And um, we were chatting and, you know, you said to me, Angus, you know, you, you figured out these plots and Aristotle's figured out these plots that have these therapeutic effects. What could stimulate optimism? And so I had the most unoriginal thought in the history of the world. And I thought, well, obviously fairy tales. Fairy tales must stimulate optimism because these really awesome things are happening in fairy tales. So I'm going to go take a look at some fairy tales and see how they're working. And as I kind of started to poke into the research and kind of read around and kind of work with, with groups, I discovered that actually a lot of fairy tales, in particular modern fairy tales, actually don't have quite as positive effect as you would think. And that actually a lot of times they um, make people feel happy in the short term, but they don't provide a kind of sustainable happiness. And I started to think to myself, I thought, hmm, it's so odd that fairy tales would have been around for all this time if they're not producing a sustainable happiness. It's so odd. And I started to look back in history and I realized that there are older fairy tales that do different things than modern fairy tales. And there's this really remarkable history um, that kind of is in the Italian Renaissance and then moves into these uh, salons with these female authors in 17th century Paris. And they're kind of reaching back to these folk traditions of fairy tales. And one of the things that you realize in these folk traditions is that there's a huge emphasis on luck. And this emphasis on luck actually doesn't even necessarily originate in these fairy tales. It goes all the way back to the very origins of, of comedy in the ancient world. And this idea that just something very lucky can happen. And the idea that something lucky can happen is really chased out of a lot of modern fairy tales. And for two reasons. Um, the first is that people consider it very bad storytelling just to have something lucky happen. You know, um, I'm someone who spent a lot of time working in Hollywood. Um, and if you just do something lucky in a script, the producer will immediately get very agitated and they'll say, well, what motivated that? You know, that doesn't make any sense. You can't just have lucky things happen. It has to be for some reason. And the other reason it gets chased out, and this happens in the comics code, it happens in the, in the movie codes that are during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, 
is producers in Hollywood and the entertainment industry start to think, well, we've got to promote virtue. And if we're promoting virtue, then good things can only happen if good people do them. So anytime something good happens in a story, a good person has to do something good. That's the only way to have it. And so you start to have this relentless emphasis on uh, you know, good people doing good things, and then those good people are happy. Well, that's all wonderful, and there's nothing wrong with that. But in life, in the real world, you will notice there's a lot of good people doing good things, and it doesn't always work out. You know, you can be a wonderful person, you can be a kind, loving person, and life can be very hard and unexpectedly brutal. And if you surround yourself only with stories that tell you um, good things happen to good people, and that's the only kind of story, then if bad things are happening to you, what you start to think in your head is, well, then I must be doing something wrong. I must actually be a bad person. I must be a bad person because bad things are happening to me. Um, and if I'm a bad person and bad things are happening to me, then things are going to get worse because bad things happen to bad people and they get badder and badder and badder. And this is known as catastrophizing. It's this idea that once something goes wrong, everything's going to go wrong because you can't stop it from happening. And, you know, I see in my students today an epic of catastrophizing. You know, something will happen, something unfortunate, often not their fault, something bad will happen in their life, and they'll get very, very down about it. And they'll think, well, this is really the end of everything. This is going to start this kind of chain of consequences. And even if it's not totally logical, it's emotional in their head. Well, what these older fairy tales do is they say, no, that's not how life is at all. Sometimes good things come, can come unexpectedly from bad things. Sometimes you can just be lucky. <laughs> Sometimes for no reason whatsoever, life can turn around. And when it turns out when you tell people that story, it improves their hope in this durable way. Because what it means is that anytime something bad happens to them, they'll often say to themselves, that was just bad luck. That wasn't because I'm a bad person. That was just something that I can kind of, um, kind of brush off. And as you know yourself, um, one, of, one of the uh, founders of your lab, Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania, he's written extensively on this and the importance of having bad things be extrinsic to us and not taking bad things as personal or our fault, but saying that those bad things are things that will pass um, and then focusing on the good things that we already have in our life and having gratitude for those. So, that was a big insight that I had that was driven by you. And if anyone's interested, they can read that chapter in the book or they can just go back and look at older fairy tales and they can see how those older fairy tales have a different effect on them and can inspire this openness to the idea that for no reason at all, out of a dark storm cloud, suddenly the sun can break, your pessimism can pass and life can be happy again. Beautiful, Angus. Really, really fascinating. And yes, so to to the work that uh, that Martin Seligman did on learned optimism, on on a uh, uh, sense of helplessness, and then uh, uh, how people, um, you know, what is going on mentally when people are pessimistic, uh, and uh, and so he talked about the the pessimistic explanatory style. When something happens, how do you tell yourself and others about, you know, how do you frame it? How do you interpret it, right? And so you're exactly right. The, the, the formula for a pessimistic explanatory style is when something bad happens to you, you think of it as personal, permanent, and pervasive. So this is awful. It's always going to be awful. It's in every part of my life and it's my fault, right? So just what you were saying, the whole poetic justice thing, the whole like I, it, good things happen to good people. That was a bad thing. Therefore, I must be a bad person. Not just I must have just screwed up, but I must be a bad person, right? And goodness gracious, how is that helpful to anybody to think that anything that bad happens in your life, therefore you must be, you know, a dark souled uh, character. So this notion of these these lucky twists, these things that can happen out of nowhere, unmerited, not deserved, and yet the universe sometimes affords those things to us, can, I think, I think it's a brilliant insight that that kind of literature can help condition us to think about, to open up the possibility for, maybe even to expect, you know, today there might be some kind of unexpected lucky twist that happens. Let me like be on the lookout for it. And if it does, I can be like, yes, see, there was the lucky twist today. 
I mean, and the key that you're emphasizing, which I think is wonderful, is there's a difference between optimism and magical thinking. You know, magical thinking is, oh, there's definitely going to be luck in my future. You know, I'm guaranteed to have luck, you know. Um, but optimism is thinking, I could be lucky. It has happened before. It could happen again. And just being open to luck. And, and that's the condition that I think you need to have if you want to be a happy growing person is to not shut yourself down in a state of fear to try and kind of protect yourself because you think, oh my goodness, you know, bad things are always going to happen. You know, everything is a kind of trigger for my anxiety. And instead of opening up and saying, no, no, there can be these positive things. I, I have to open myself up. Um, and I wish I could take credit for the insight, but of course, in addition to Martin Seligman having this insight, uh, Madame Donoy, the coiner of the term fairy tale, one of those 17th century female Solanists. I mean, she all throughout her fairy tales just has these moments where fairies just pop out of the sky and wave a wand and then everything is happy. Um, and this was condemned by the kind of rational philosophers of the time. They got very irritated by this and said, oh, it's totally illogical. How can you have these fairies showing up and doing these things? You no, know, this is a bunch of kind of, you know, hysterical, irrational women. Um, but those fairy tales work. Madame Donoy was right. It's not rational, but life does not always have to be rational um, to make sense. So that I think is the kind of grand insight of literature um, is that sometimes fictions um, can be more helpful than logical facts. Okay, so I'm, I'm glad you went there and I'm glad you talked about kind of a, 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 a magical thinking because um, I wanna kind of ask you about the limits of this, right? And so I think if I'm hearing you correctly, and we've had conversations about this before, I think what you're saying to go back to the chocolate metaphor is, um, you know, chocolate can be really good, but let's maybe not have a diet of 100% chocolate, right? And so in these cases where our students or we ourselves are feeling oppressed by, you know, this sense that if there's you know, if there are bad things happening to me, that must be a reflection of my awful character. Um, it can lighten things up. It can, it can, it can give us some breathing room. It can, it can allow us to, um, to, to um, uh, be open, as you say, to to life in some life giving ways. Which I don't think you're then arguing that we shouldn't worry about doing good things or we shouldn't you know that, that it's just like we can just like lie on the couch and you know eat potato chips and good things will happen right so what's the balance would you say between you know the the being open to the lucky twist but who was it who said that you know fortune favors the prepared so so good fortune and and our and our actions like how do those intertwine yeah well no absolutely and and you know and this is the thing is is if you have a practical approach to literature then it's everything is situational it's based on where you are and also where the people in your life are at that moment and it's there's not a kind of a sense in which you can ever have a perfect book or you know just do one thing over and over and over again and be perfect so you can't just kind of achieve bliss by reading a fairy tale um, instead the point is is that if you're feeling blue if you're feeling sad if you're feeling down if you catch yourself falling into a state of mind where you're just kind of giving up and you're not trying your hardest because you just think it's not going to matter anyway um, I mean, that's just a state I see in a lot of my students where they give up before they fully try. That's when you want to kind of spark your optimism. That's when you want to think positively. Um, if you're in a state where you're already thinking positively, then yes, you don't need more positive thought. You might need empathy. <laughs> you might need curiosity. You might need these other things. Um, and, you know, the kind of broader thing back to your chocolate analogy here is you don't want to always be reading the same kind of book all the time. Um, I mean, uh, to, to shift genres here to Hamlet, Hamlet's problem to a certain extent is that he grieves too much. He gets too caught in a cycle of grief. And that's something that could also happen to us. I mean, speaking from personal experience, when something sad like that happens to you, you can get caught in a cycle where you're kind of wallowing in your own sadness and you're going round and round and you're only surrounding yourself with sad things. And to a certain extent, that can be healthy to surround yourself with sad things when you're sad, because that can help you to grieve, can help you process. But if you do it too much, then you get the opposite effect. And so it's always about kind of saying what's kind of good in the long term. And the way you gauge what's good for the long term is you look around you to the people in your life and you say, what effect is my behavior having on them? Um, you know, if I'm a kind of a happier person, is that helping them? If I slow down and stop being fake happy and actually work through my grief and do the hard work 
of kind of becoming a, a, a deeper person? Is that what's better for them? And so you can never just kind of find the answer in yourself or in a single book. It's always found in this kind of broader library, both the broader library of your bookshelf and the broader library of the people around you. So part of what I love about Wonderworks, Angus, is that you um, uh, make a, an astonishing number of really helpful suggestions for where people can look for um, this kind of um, uh, narrative technology. And so, you know, if you are uh, into fairy tales, perfect. There's a lot uh, that, that can be found there. If you're more into, you know, comic books or romances or other kinds of things, like there's a lot of different places where these kinds of narrative technologies can be found, a lot of different genres within the, it, within which it can be found. So you can kind of find the, um, the, 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 the I'm, I'm working on the metaphor here. You can find the, the exact kind of chocolate that you like. If you're a milk chocolate person, go for it. If you're a dark chocolate person, go for it. Okay, so I wonder if we could do one other, um, you know, uh, may, maybe, the good, maybe the good way of thinking about Wonderworks is kind of, it's like a smorgasbord because it's got 25 different dishes. We've been talking about chocolate. Um, maybe now we can talk about, um, I don't know, um, uh, lasagna or or or, uh, or or meatloaf or some kind of comfort food uh, that um, that can help us to find peace of mind. And so you have a really fascinating chapter connecting Virginia Woolf and William James um, and uh, the eating of a Madeleine uh, to 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 bring us into this understanding of how literature can bring peace of mind. So can you tell us how you connect James's notion of stream of consciousness with some of these, uh, you know, with, with Virginia Woolf's writing, for example? Yeah, so, I mean, and this is just another kind of extraordinary moment in the history of literature. And, it, and um, one of the questions I often get asked from people is people often say, Angus, you know, so many authors are so dysfunctional. Why would I ever go to them to try and help myself, you know? I mean, you know, I mean, writers are always struggling, you know, with kind of like, you know, deep things in their head and they're often unhappy or suffering or making themselves or other people around them happy, you know? How, how could they possibly have any insight whatsoever? Well, both Wolf and William James had a similar kind of psychiatric struggle. And that, that struggle was one of restless thoughts, agitated thoughts that actually trended into suicidal ideation. Um, and, you know, this, this, this constant way in which they could not find peace in their own heads. And, you know, they couldn't sleep, they couldn't rest. Virginia Woolf, as a, as a young woman, throws herself out of a window. Um, you know, uh, uh, James, you know, um, had, was diagnosed with nerves and sent on this tour and basically banned from reading. And both of them were, in fact, told that reading was the source of their problems. They were both told, you know, when you read books, it kind of gets your mind all agitated and then your mind kind of agitates your nerves and then you're all just kind of like twitching around. Um, and the kind of psychiatric advice at the time, which was meant to be kind, was in fact incredibly cruel because people thought that that the nervous system was overstimulated. They invented this thing known as the rest cure. And the idea was that you were supposed to rest and do nothing stimulating at all. And so in the case of Virginia Woolf and many, many women, many women were diagnosed with nerves, many, uh, you know, or, or hysteria, as it was sometimes often kind of called, um, as were many veterans of war. And the rest cure was basically to put someone in a bed for weeks and not allow them to do anything and to feed them huge quantities of milk <laughs> because this was thought to kind of calm them down. And Virginia Woolf has this very angry letter she writes, you know, basically where she kind of accuses her doctor of turning her into an enormous cow, basically, by constantly feeding her milk in the bed and, and how it was deeply unhealthy for her. And so both she and James set out to find a different answer. They said there has to be a different way to calm my mind. What could that be? And they arrived at the same answer. And that answer is ultimately stream of consciousness writing. And, you know, James has this realization that up to his time, philosophers had thought of ideas as these kinds of like individual things that just kind of like arrived in the mind, almost like the, 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 the metaphor is often a train or a chain of ideas. And James says, well, it's possible for ideas to do that, but when they do that, they're constantly shocking us, you know? It's like a new idea has just come into my head, another new idea, another new idea, another new idea. And we don't want that kind of shock, 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 disjunctive effect. We want it to be a, like a river. We want it to be like a stream, we want it to be liquid. And we've all had that feeling. That's a feeling that um, modern psychologists might call flow, for example, 
where you just feel this stream, this kind of calm stream. And all of us have felt that at times in our lives when we've been so immersed in an activity, we just feel ourselves in that state of flow where the ideas are so smoothly connected. And James has this brilliant moment in this uh, philosophical essay for mind where he says, you can see that in good writing. Because in good writing, they have these transitions. Like for example, as a simple example, the word and, and is a transition that helps link these ideas together and kind of smooths them out. And then he says, and good writers have much better ones than just and, but I'm just giving you that as an example, you know. Um, and Virginia Woolf basically sets out to write the kind of ideal William Jamesian stream of consciousness novel. And she accomplishes it in Mrs. Dalloway. And what happens in Mrs. Dalloway is, is if you read the novel, it's one of just the most beautiful novels ever written. It's just extraordinary. You just have these liquid, liquid thoughts of these characters. Um, so smooth, um, so peace inducing. And then she does this even more extraordinary thing where she jumps smoothly from the mind of one character to another character to another character. And so you get this experience almost like you're in this giant ocean with all these different rivers from all these different minds. And you can watch all of them as they experience all their own emotions. And you are constantly with them, but also above them in this liquid calm. And so this is this huge insight that both of them generate out of their struggles with existing psychology. And both of them find an answer in writing. Um, and both of them give that gift onto others. In addition to reading Virginia Woolf's novel, which I cannot recommend enough, I would also heavily, heavily recommend reading James, because if you are suffering yourself from agitated thoughts, reading James, his style, um, his kind of liquid prose will have the same or a similar therapeutic effect on your mind. Fantastic. I want to follow up with that, Angus. But before I do, I just want to mention we are just about at the time where we are going to transition to the Q&A. And in just a moment, we'll turn it back to Sarah. So for those of you who are uh, with us uh, in the audience, if you have questions, comments, uh, uh, points of disagreement, it's all welcome. Um, if you uh, just would type those into the chat, uh, then when Sarah comes to um, lead the Q&A, we'll have uh, plenty of things to talk about. So go ahead and do that if you would, uh, if you would like to. So Angus, I want to um, come back to what you were just saying about peace of mind. First of all, I love what you said about, well, I love William James. So I love anything you say about William James. Uh, he's, uh, he's my guy. Um, I wrote my dissertation on him, then a book, named my firstborn son after him. So I'm, I'm really uh, a William James fan. Um, and he is a master of transitions. If you, you know, when you read his texts, the way he moves from one paragraph to another uh, is, just, is just masterful. So I love what you were saying about that stream of consciousness. And, and I wanna um, kind of ask you to, 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 to say a little bit more about that metaphor of the rivers and the ocean. What you were saying really sounds a lot like mindfulness to me, right? And so you're, when, when you're practicing mindfulness meditation, one way of, of thinking about it is you are aware of the thoughts and feelings that you have, but you're also aware that you're aware of them. And that position of, of, of observation or of awareness can help to give you relief from that jerking around, you know, being jerked around from one idea to another idea. So is that, would you agree with that? And if so, how do you see that, the reading of these streams of consciousness by a consciousness who's reading them? Like, how does that bring kind of, you know, peace of mind and mindfulness. Yeah, no, this is brilliant, of course, James. And yes, I mean, that sense of being detached from, but also being aware of difficult feelings is very important to processing them. If we um, are just detached from the feelings, you know, then how do we learn how to process them? You know, we just go into a kind of escapist space. And actually, one of the things that can actually be unhelpful about literature is that you just read it for escape. Because if you just read it for escapism, what happens is you get a temporary relief when you go into this kind of other space, this other world, but then you have this shock of re-entry when you come back into your own life. And it's again, that feeling of the kind of train effect. And so really what's happening here with this kind of Jamesian technique is to allow you to make sense of and to process these hard emotions from a slight distance. 
um, which allows you to kind of understand them without necessarily responding as intensely as you would otherwise. And a lot of times by achieving that distance, you respond to them in the way that your mind would naturally respond to them, because actually it's become oversensitive to some of those feelings. And so a big part of what you're actually doing is you're kind of helping your brain recover its more kind of natural uh, uh, equilibrium state, you know, as opposed to necessarily, you know, kind of teaching it anything radically new. Um, and, you know, this is kind of the, I think, the kind of intuition that James has about this, um, that Wolf is able to substantiate and expand for her own writing, that we don't want to not acknowledge our difficult thoughts. I mean, we don't want to run from grief. We don't want to run from fear. We don't want to kind of push these things out of our life. I mean, I think one of the difficulties we have in the modern world is people are often unwilling to deal with hard emotions. And we spend a lot of time as people trying to pretend they don't exist or having Instagram accounts that just kind of wipe any kind of blemish clear. Um, but the reality of a healthy life is it's able to acknowledge those things while at the same time saying, you know, life is still wonderful. Life is hard and life is still wonderful. Um, you know, um, I lose people. I myself will be lost, but I have joy and they had joy. Um, and that sense of both being in, um, because when you read Mrs. Dalloway, I don't want to give away any plot spoilers, but, but very hard things happen in that novel. Um, you know, there's a lot of grief. There's a lot of struggle. Um, there's a young man who comes back from war. Um, there are people struggling with kind of various mental difficulties. But at the same time, you come out of that novel feeling a sense of joy and then also a sense of serenity and really peace at the end. And so it's the coupling of those two together, as you've described. And the fact that our mind, unlike logic, can be two things at the same time. Our mind can be experiencing something and observing itself experience something. And, you know, classically in logic, that's impossible. One thing can't be two things at the same time. But... In science, in neuroscience, in psychology, it can be possible. Our brain can be two places at the same time. Um, our, our brain can be more than itself. Well, Angus, this is just utterly fascinating. And we've just had time to just take a taste of two out of the 25 dishes uh, in this amazing smorgasbord that is Wonderworks. So I deeply encourage everyone who is on this call, uh, if you haven't had a chance to uh, buy the book, Wonder Book, uh, Wonder Works, I encourage you to, to buy it and um, have your own uh, uh, taste uh, sampling um, and uh, 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 find the chapter that most resonates with where you are and uh, uh, the narrative technology that might be most useful um, to you. So with all that said, uh, I'm now going to turn it over to Sarah to see what questions uh, are in from the audience. So thank you so much. I totally agree. That's fascinating stuff. And I think I am hungry to read and to eat now. So well done on both fronts. Um, so yeah, we've got some great juicy questions in the chat. I'm going to kind of jump into the middle, a little bit of a structural question. Um, how does Angus determine what mental effect a specific literary device induces? For instance, how did you conclude that stories with random good promote optimism and link those two things? So um... The answer to this is lots of different ways. Um, and there's also a lot of open-endedness and there's a lot that we don't know. So um, the book does not pretend to um, say that we know everything about literature, that we know everything about the human brain. What the book does is the book uses the existing science, um, the same way that Aristotle did to kind of identify these narrative techniques. And then, you know, in my lab here and with the help of other labs, I mean, James and I are actually working a bit on this, on this project now. We run experiments to kind of see, to learn more, basically, to say, you know, how are these predictions holding up and, and, and how much um, more can we learn by doing them? So the main, the main thing here is to be as specific as you can about what you think is causing the effect in the book. So, you know, there, there has been a history of studies on literature that will say something like, if you read a book, it increases empathy. But it doesn't explain what is going on in the book that creates empathy, um, nor does it explain the phenomenon known as false empathy, where readers oftentimes feel like they're empathizing. You know, this is common in Jane Austen novels, where Jane Austen characters are often experiencing false empathy and then being satirized by the narrator. 
So the main thing that makes the book scientific, I want to emphasize, is not that somehow that I have a magic brain scanner in my lab and that we have seen into the depths of the human psychology and know everything about everything. Um, what makes it scientific is it's very specific about the predictions that it makes, um, and it's very specific about the effects and how it connects them. And it relies on what we know about both what's called narrative theory, which is the kind of basis for how we identify the, um, the inventions, and then also the existing state of psychology. And it's doing its best um, to kind of bridge the gap in between. But I certainly do not want to pretend like um, the book is the authoritative word uh, in science. And if I can chime in, um, I think this is, you know, part of what's unique about this book is that it's a book about literature, but these are not 25 theses about literature. These are 25 hypotheses about literature. And so from my standpoint, you know, thinking about the positive humanities, which brings together the science of well-being with the arts, you know, with arts and culture, including literature, with scientific uh, methods of investigation. This is really exciting because it allows us to say, uh, as, as as Angus mentioned, we're, we're beginning to do, well, how would we test this hypothesis? And um, and not just in the, in the sense of, you know, right or wrong, but in the sense of turning up the dial on this thing, right? So if, if, if reading Virginia Woolf can give us peace of mind, is there a way of coming at Virginia Woolf? Is there a way of, um, you know, is there a dosage effect, right? Do you need to read Virginia Woolf for a half an hour every day? Or do you need to, you know, talk with others about what you've been reading? Like, how can we unlock more of those positive effects? And again, because of, of how Angus has brilliantly set this up, it becomes hypotheses that can be tested. And, you know, to James's point, I mean, we've actually just done a study here at the medical school with our medical students, where we've shown that not just reading literature, but discussing literature can help alleviate burnout. Um, and so, you know, this isn't just a book about literature. It's a book about all the things that happen with literature and around literature and the importance of having those conversations with people. And, you know, one of the main reasons for that in terms of burnout is burnout is associated with a loss of empathy and, and depersonalization and all these kinds of things and getting together and talking with people about stories and sharing stories and doing these things can kind of activate these parts of the brain um, that can help it sort of, you know, regenerate and refresh itself a little bit. And, you know, the goal here is really to, you know, I mean, story science, which is what I do, is really in its infancy. I mean, you know, I mean, it's sort of what, where, you know, um, you know, biology was in the 19th century or something like that. Um, and if you go back and you read, you know, I mean, Darwin's probably, you know, the most prescient of all the biologists in the 19th century. And if you go back and read The, the Origin of Species, um, there's so much brilliant stuff in there, but there's also these moments where he's like talking about blue-eyed cats and kind of what they mean and all this other kind of stuff. So I have no question, I have no doubt whatsoever that many of my own writing have blue-eyed cats and other things in them that are wrong. But the important thing is the method here and encouraging people to, to, to think that there's this huge possibility for us to learn more about literature and get more from literature um, and to kind of value literature in, in, these, in these ways that can be supported by medicine and, and, and psychology and not just kind of abandon it to these, what we would call in science, unfalsifiable arguments. In other words, you know, what has existed up to this point is basically you know, I would just have my interpretation and no one can prove me wrong. And because no one can prove me wrong, well, then how do you know there isn't a spaghetti monster in the 23rd dimension that created all of humanity, you know? Um, and, you know, what we're saying, no, I'm actually coming out there and, and saying, here is something that you can prove right or wrong. And if you prove me wrong, I'll, I'll back away. Terrific. Thank you. Um, so someone asks, I, I'm actually going to link together two questions here because I think they may work well that way. Uh, someone asks, what are the notable innovations of the last decade or two? Possibly that means the dominant, like what are we seeing in a lot of narratives? And has Hollywood caught up with them swiftly or not? And someone else then asks, um, when there's a lot of especially like short online narrative content, is that literature in the same way that you're talking about literature? Um, and what are the in what ways is that drawing on the grand tradition that other literature also is? 
Yeah, so to answer the, um, the first question, um, yeah, there have been a lot of kind of extraordinary breakthroughs, which I talk about a bit in the book. I mean, I talk about Tina Fey and Alison Bechdel um, and Lena Ferrante and all these writers. And I guess maybe two kind of big, simple things that I would say is there has been a lot of, a lot of writing that has figured out new ways to deal with, for example, trauma. And, you know, the ancient Greeks um, sort of in tragedy had kind of figured out these ways to, to help veterans. And veterans are often, are often suffer from a kind of trauma that comes from sudden moments of impact. But a lot of modern survivors of, say, domestic abuse suffer from chronic trauma. And what happens there is a very different kind of trauma, one that leads to kind of dissociation and numbness and derealization, depersonalization, these kinds of things, which are very different from kind of uncontrollable emotions and things that you experience in traditional PTSD. And, you know, so I have a chapter in the book about how kind of modern writers, I mean, Alison Bechdel specifically, have kind of figured out how to develop ways of writing that help with this kind of new, newly kind of dominant form of, of, of trauma. And then, of course, loneliness. Loneliness is much less of a problem in the ancient world because families were thrown together. I mean, it's not that long ago when you read Virginia Woolf in A Room of One's Own, she's complaining she never gets any time to herself. You know, she's constantly being bombarded. And I think really up until about the middle of the 20th century um, in America and Britain, women had almost no free time at all. I mean, you know, they were constantly, you know, they never had what we would now call solitude. Well, now we've created a world where we almost have too much solitude where so much of us spend so much of our time alone on devices and other kinds of things. And so as I talk about in the chapter in Elena Ferrante, she has this really wonderful way of dealing with loneliness. And there's a lot of Pulp Fiction out there that is actually very good and effective. A lot of kind of these modern forms. Um, as far as kind of um, Hollywood, well, I mean, Hollywood can't be kind of thrown in a giant box, but Hollywood is conservative with a little C in terms of what it does. It's just always driven by this money anxiety. And so I would just say that in general, you're never or almost never going to see something really on the leading edge with Hollywood. If you want to kind of find the kind of breakthrough moments in literature that are almost certainly being done by a poet or a memoirist or a novelist out there. Um, and then usually if Hollywood figures out that it's safe to get into the water, they'll do it like five or 10 years later. They'll do like an adaptation, which is kind of almost as good as the book that you like. So that's my general experience as someone who spent a fair amount of time working there. It's not a very kind of risk-taking industry. Um, as far as this kind of short form narratives, um, yes, absolutely there are literature. I mean, literature is anything that you find helps you <laughs> deal in a sustainable way with something in your life. And so, um, you know, if there is a kind of particular way in which those short form narratives are helping you or someone you know, then yes. Um, it is, however, also the case, and I say this in the book, that there are a lot of kinds of modern commercial narratives, which are much more short term. I mean, going back to the food analogy, it's a lot like just kind of feeding you unrefined sugar over and over and over and over again. And your body's like, oh, this is great. I just love all this sugar. It's so delicious. Um, and then all of a sudden you wake up one morning and you're like, I don't feel so good. Um, and a lot of content, which is curated for immediate satisfaction and immediate gratification, doesn't necessarily have the kind of same sustainable well-being effect as things that are more thoughtfully curated. Um, and, you know, in general, my number one piece of advice is find, instead of just kind of scrolling around the Internet to find something, talk to a friend, talk to someone you respect and ask them for a book that changed their life. Go talk to a librarian, <laughs> ask them, you know, what is a book, you know? And so instead of just always kind of trying to kind of solve our own problems, you know, by going on Twitter or whatever, there are people who just know more because they've spent more time. And because they've spent more time and they've invested more time, they kind of can see the long-term effects of, of the works in a way that someone who's on the internet just trying to snatch your attention for 13 seconds isn't really interested. Yes, well put. <laughs> um, so a little bit in the same vein, but a slightly different direction. Um, if we have wonder works, like the ones you've been talking about, um, do we really need the metaverse? And the questioner clarifies meaning by the metaverse, immersive, highly visual environments that take the place of an active imagination. Uh, is that an effort to find an alternative path to the same effect that you can get from Wonderworks. Not your book, Wonderworks, but the contents of your book. <laughs> you 
Yeah, no, this is funny. I was actually at Foo Camp about uh, two and a half weeks ago. Foo Camp is this weird invite only thing. It was actually held at Meta this year where they bring together all these hackers and we talk about the future and uh, we met Nick Clegg and, and the various kinds of high ups um, at, uh, at Meta. And yeah, I'm very skeptical about the metaverse. Very skeptical. Um, I mean, I think first of all, um, the imagination that's in our head is much more powerful for us than something that we just absorb from outside. And I, as I think the question indicates, I mean, it's sort of like if you went to a gym and instead of actually kind of, you know, running or lifting the weights, you actually just got in a machine and the machine just moved your arms around for you and then you got out of the machine. Um, it, you, know, you, you know, working at it is important. That's one of the reasons why children, um, you know, they, they, they experience all these wonderful well-being effects from literature because when they read the book, and especially if you can get kids a book when they're young and kind of keep them off too many screens, you know, because again, the screen is doing so much of the work for them. Not that the screen is necessarily a negative, terrible thing. I don't want to fear monger. I don't think you're destroying your child's future if they watch TV on a tablet or something. But if you give them a book, it gives them the opportunity to be more active in their imagination. I mean, that's why when you go see a movie, you always feel disappointed. Because you're like, oh, it's not the way that I imagined it. And it's because you've done so much work. And in fact, your work has gone beyond Hollywood. Hollywood put $150 million into that movie and your imagination was still better. I mean, that's why Shakespeare says at the beginning of Henry V, we're not going to give you any costumes here. We're going to just give you a bunch of guys pretending to be on horses, knocking coconuts together. That's what you're going to get. Why? Because that's my gift to you. My gift to you is, is you using your imagination. I'm going to give you the bare minimum. And I do think that in the modern world today, you know, people sometimes don't want to read because it seems so much work. Like, oh, it's so hard to read a book, you know? And certainly I know this. Whenever I, I uh, talk to people in the publishing community, they get very nervous anytime like a book it seems like it's too long, or too complicated or anything like that. You know, oh no, we gotta, you know, we're competing with the internet. It's gotta be, you know, as like simple as possible. But the reality of life is that work is a gift. The fact that life is hard is life's gift to us because it means there's always room to grow. I mean, if everything was easy all the time, it would just be incredibly boring um, and incredibly unsatisfying. And certainly, of course, there are times when life is too hard and we need to help each other through those times. But we shouldn't be afraid of hard work, particularly when it comes in the form of a book, because a book is a friend. And that work is all there specifically to grow us. So absolutely, I'm a big fan of, of the idea that the future is in books, not in the metaverse. Um, and that, you know, we just need to spend probably more time with each other and less trying, trying to imagine mechanical contraptions that are somehow going to fix our lives for us. And Angus, can I just chime in on that? Cause I think that's really, really true. And I, I, um, you know, you were talking about the importance of effort, uh, and, um, it, it made me think about, uh, William James's discussion of effort. And he says the effort of attention is the basis of will. So I think it's it's important for growth. I think it's important for freedom that we not shy away from making that effort because what is more fundamental and basic to our individual or collective freedom than the ability that James talks about to hold one thought in our mind as opposed to another, to make those choices. Uh, James you know, writes, um, uh, my experience is what I agree to attend to. And if what you're doing is simply opening up and allowing other people to make those decisions for you, uh, then then you are likely to become, um, you know, to lose your 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 moral tone, as you as you indicated, and to become less free as a human being. Yeah, and less happy. I mean, you know, one of the things is that you know. I have been drawn in my life into a lot of work actually in AI, ironically, because I'm a skeptic of AI. And so what happens when you're a skeptic of AI is people bring you in and you have to work with AI constantly. But one of the things that computers are always trying to do and people are always trying to use computers to do is predict the future. There's this obsession with, if we just gave computers enough data, they would predict the future. And first of all, to your point, that's essentially just eliminating freedom and possibility. You know, this giant computer has all the information. Life is a giant machine. And that's actually really psychologically depressing for humans, as William James points out. Whether or not we have free will or not, it's very important for us to believe that we do, mm -hmm. because the moment we give up on that, um, we get sad. And the other thing it leaves out is the fact that predicting the future and seeing the future 
is only one way to live life. The other way to live life is to make the future, is to create the future. And that's kind of what I've talked about in the book is that all these artists came around, they saw an opportunity to do something new. They saw an opportunity to make a new kind of art. And all of us have this in our lives to make new art, to make new science, to make new technology, to make new anything. And that's the unique opportunity afforded to us by our freedom is the chance to say, I don't just have to take the world as it has been inherited and given to me. I have the opportunity to make a new world, to make a new future and to make new books and to make new life. And I think that is the kind of the ultimate opportunity that people who become overly obsessed with computers sometimes miss out on um, is the chance that there's this kind of like greater affordance in life. That is beautiful. I mean, I think uh, some of us are a little biased by being library people and being oriented, <laughs> you know, but yes, beautifully expressed. Um, so I think we may be kind of moving toward a close. Um, we can bring up a couple more things, perhaps anybody in the audience who has not yet popped your question in the chat, um, please feel free to do so. Um, I'm just going to throw in uh, something that I've been asking of many of the authors that we've spoken to the last few months. So of course, you brought this book out during the era of COVID, when of course there were a lot of narratives, accurate, inaccurate, passionate, Etc. flying around. Now that's not literature necessarily, although I think now we're starting to see some actual literature coming, you know, reflecting on the pandemic. But do you want to talk just a little bit like what has it been like to bring out this book in particular during this time? And how do you feel about the way narrative is being used now? Good, bad, moral, not moral, happy, unhappy? Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, I was actually just quoted in a piece in The Atlantic, I think last week on, on COVID and narratives. Um, and, you know, the one thing I'll say is that I don't really think of narratives as being good or bad or evil or immoral. I mean, I, I know we live in a time when there's a lot of concern about disinformation and false narratives and all these kinds of things. The real problem is the lack of diversity and the lack of variety in narratives. Um, I mean, we, we need more narratives. We need more voices. We need more people coming up with different ways. We need more openness and curiosity and willingness to listen to different narratives. Because really the crisis of the modern moment is the fact that we just have a couple dominant narratives that keep slamming against each other. And it's just not providing enough room for all of us to be our fullest selves. We're always being compacted in these ways. We need to kind of open up ourselves. And when you do that, what you'll find is that naturally some of these less helpful narratives will start to go away because there's just more competition in this space. Um, and I think what sustains a lot of these very, very, um, I mean, a lot of times almost absurd kind of misinformation narratives um, is the fact that there's not really any alternatives out there. And so I think a lot of people feel that they get jammed into choosing between one thing or the other. And if they don't like the one thing, then they automatically go to the other. Um, even if that thing seems silly or ridiculous, um, they're just going to go with it and then they get entrenched in it. And so for me, the big thing is, you know, when you go to a library, it's not like you have two books to choose from. You don't go to a library and they're like, you know, um, you know, you can, you know, you can either read um, this book on libertarianism or this book on socialism. And these are the only two books you can read. You must decide between the pair of them. You, know, you have an enormous, vast assembly of books. And those books are subtle and complex and also, by the way, conflicted. And many of the most brilliant and beautiful writers do not always know exactly what the right answer is. You know, they don't have this absolute clarity about what we must do. And, and they don't sit in judgment on people who don't agree with them. You know, there's an openness and an expansiveness. And I think spending more of our time in spaces like libraries, also museums. I mean, you go to a museum, there's not like a style of arts. You know, you don't just go in there and then all of a sudden everything is Van Gogh or something like that, or everything is Rembrandt. You know, you walk through wall, you walk through hallways and all these different cultures have radically different kinds of beauty and joy and all these things. And I think that kind of diversification is more than anything else what our society really needs. And I know speaking as an immigrant, you know, I mean, that was always what I came to America for is a sense that it's an inclusive society in the sense it's a welcoming kind of different perspectives. Um, of course, we've talked a lot about James tonight. James is a very, he's a fundamentally democratic, pluralist thinker, you know, very inclusive, wants to have all these different opportunities. Um, and I would just say, when you look out at life, 
You know, you go into a forest, there's not one kind of tree in the forest. You don't walk around the forest and you see that there's tree. Um, you see redwoods, you see oaks, you see maples, you see pine trees, all these different kinds of trees because life is always happiest when it's tending towards diversity. Um, and so that's my, the main thing that I think is we just kind of need more diversity, more voices, more listening, more openness. And I think if we do more of those things, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of be able to sort ourselves out. We won't need to spend so much time trying to debunk false narratives and getting kind of worked up about people we disagree with. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Pawelski, anything you want to throw in on that last point or both of sure. yeah. well, you haven't said that you'd like to toss in? No, I, I was just thinking about um, Chimamanda Adichie and the, the danger of a single story, right? Uh, which I think is just brilliantly aligned with what you're saying. Um, and and I think that, uh, you know, I, I do agree that um, that there we seem to be in a world where most or at least much of the communication is much too short and rapid for nuance or subtlety or, you know, and um, it's not going to cut through if it's not cutting. Uh, and uh, and 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 there's a there's a difference between, you know, getting people's attention, and and getting people's attention and healthy, you know, for healthy ends necessarily, right? So so our minds. I, mean, I think this is kind of a, a fragility of the human mind in a sense that our our brains. Uh, uh, evolved at times of great threat, and so we're very um, sensitive to threat. Uh, you know, back in the day when there were saber-toothed tigers roaming, you had to be very sensitive to uh, a saber-toothed tiger being around. And if you were an optimist back then, you came dinner and you didn't pass your genes along. Funny thing about you guys, I don't know about where you live, but here in Philadelphia, it has been at least two or three months since we've seen a saber-toothed tiger. Uh, right. And yet we're that, but that's how our brains are primed. And so if it, if it, if it bleeds, it leads in the news. If it's something that's vicious or, or somehow grabs your attention. And I think that in literature, to my mind, um, you know, if, if you're going to be writing a, a scene about a car crash, like it's hard to mess up because car crashes are just so fascinating to us. Right. But if you're going to write a scene about, um, two people connecting at, in a deep friendship, mm -hmm. whoa, like that's hard to do, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think in our culture, as we have these modes of communication that are again, so limited, so um, partisan, uh, it, it, it kind of pushes out those, um, those complexities, those, that diversity, Angus, that you were talking about. And I do think we need to have more of that in our lives and in our, in our culture. Yeah. That really is a, a powerful encouragement to all of us, I think, to read stories, to share stories, to tell our own stories as well, potentially. It's very good. Um, I do note that my colleague put the link to The Danger of a Single Story uh, by Chimamanda Adichie in the chat, so do check that out as well. Um, great, this has been fantastic. As you commented earlier, I think we could go on talking about this uh, for a long time with great satisfaction, but I think we will draw to a close for this evening. Dr. James Kowalski, Dr. Angus Fletcher, thank you so much for being with us this evening. It's been fantastic and happy reading. Thank you, thank you so much. It's been great. <laughs>